Hi, welcome to this video on the role of electrochemical impedance spectroscopy in battery management systems. And when we talk about electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, we are talking about very small instruments, the sort of size of a mini um, PCB with the appropriate um, chips on board. So when we're talking about battery management systems, we're sort of at this primarily thinking about at the moment lithium ion batteries. And the only reason we've got the schematic up here is, is to say that you know a lithium ion battery is really a electrochemical cell on the left hand side here we have our um, anode and on the right hand side we will have our cathode and at the beginning of charge um, there's lithium ions essentially at the anode but um, during something like discharge like driving a car um, these ions are migrating across um, the um, electrochemical cell and at the same time um, electrons are traveling through the external wire and doing useful electrical work like moving the car um, forward so um, EIS or electrochemical impedance spectroscopy is a good way of us understanding the status of this battery during its charging, during its discharging and how the status of this battery can actually change um, during the um, lifetime of the battery. Um, so the question is really why impedance spectroscopy? Why does impedance spectroscopy have a role as part of a battery management system? And the answer for us at ZP is that um, Really, it's a very good way of characterizing an electrochemical cell. And when I mean an electrochemical cell, I mean the kind of simplest element of a battery. That is, you have an anode and you have a cathode, and in between them you have an electrolyte. And I know we've just put a schematic up of a lithium um, ion battery a minute ago, and there there's a anode um, where the ions are, the lithium ions are initially, and then they migrate across to the cathode during the discharge, but then they can be returned during the charging. And EIS is a good way of understanding or characterizing that electrochemical cell um, at the beginning of its lifetime, half through its lifetime, and at the end of its lifetime. But I will um, go into that in a little bit more detail in a bit. What's nice about EIS as an analytical technique is it's non-destructive and that we can actually do it in real time and in situ. So it's not a laboratory technique it is great that you can you can use it in a laboratory setting in a research setting but you can actually take that technology out and you know put it onto battery packs and even put it into the for example the cars themselves um it's very comprehensive and what we mean by that is it's you'll see this in a bit in some other slides that it can use a range of frequencies so it's not unusual to do impedance spectroscopy um at one hertz or one cycle per second to a million hertz or a million cycles per second. And this allows us to interrogate that battery um, in quite a lot of detail. There's a lot of processes in a battery. You've got a anode where electrons are transferred. You've got an electrolyte through which um, the lithium ions, for example, are migrating. You've got a cathode um, where electrons are um, being exchanged and you've also got the cathode of course again where um, the lithium ions in terms of discharging end up um, but of course all that can be reversed if you're running a um, recharging mode but these different frequencies that it has this range of frequencies means that we can interrogate different elements within this electrochemical um, cell and I will dig into that a little bit deeper now electrochemical impedance spectroscopy there are many ways of modeling and doing data science these days you can pretend that the um, electrochemical cell or battery is really just a black box and you're just going to characterize it and then there'll be features in your data that are indicative of state of health state of charge um, and the sort of useful life left in that battery but um, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy actually offers models that are somewhat anchored in the real world so it says you know, it's actually the anode that's the problem or it's the cathode that's the problem or it's the electrolyte that's the problem so it's not just the data says this battery is going to fail the data says this battery is going to fail because this element is showing a corrosion or something is drying out or something is leaking so it does try to anchor it now it does this through um, using what's called equivalent circuits and i will dig into um, equivalent circuits um, as well and it's also a sensitive um, technique that impedance spectroscopy if the resistance goes from of a battery goes from you know um, one ohm to five ohms um, impedance spectroscopy will will tell you that it's not um, it is sensitive to fairly small changes um, in the battery 
Um, what's nice about um, impedance spectroscopy as part of a battery management system is um, you didn't have to have things intrinsic in an electrochemical cell. It's enough for us to just attach um, to the um, the wires or the cables on a cell or on a battery or on a module um, so we can make electrical connections. So this technology is intrinsically quite small, but it can also be connected um, external to the um, battery. Um, we'll dig into this a little in a little bit, but impedance spectroscopy, what it's really doing is interrogating the state of the battery by using um, small perturbations in voltage, using a sinusoidal wave and looking at the response of the um, current. And um, as I say, there's a model then that will help you understand this data and that model, we would call it an equivalent circuit. But the equivalent circuit, we can measure different elements in this equivalent circuit. Some of these elements tell us about the electrolytes, some of these elements tell us about the um, um, electrodes. Some of these elements tell us actually about the diffusion rate of um, lithium ions through it. And if any of the, these values start to um, change with time, we can essentially um, plot these things. And you could be doing this really in real time, you know, um, with a sort of modern battery management system. You could be baselining the battery at the beginning of life and then looking for changes and drifts over time and actually making a little call on it when you sort of think that that battery has kind of come to its first at the end of its first useful life doesn't mean it doesn't have a secondary life but its first useful life if i could just kind of um schematically demonstrate you know what is happening to um batteries um you know we start off with a battery its state of health is high and it's um if it's first charged its state of charge is high now obviously with time these batteries are charged and discharged um and so the state of discharge here for example it's you know at 50 percent now there's some point at which actually you will try to recharge batteries, but in fact they don't recharge. They're essentially fading now. Um, they may be at, they may be coming to the end of their first useful life. You know, there's a kind of a dud zone here um, where the battery essentially can't store charge anymore, and we've essentially reduced the state of charge, but we've also reduced um, the state of health. Um, now what impedance spectroscopy is doing is it is and I want to say here, pretending that this electrochemical cell is a equivalent circuit. And this equivalent circuit has resistance capacitors in it. And we can start to determine their values. And we, we would say that at the beginning of life on a battery or a cell, these values have a certain um, value. And things like resistances or impedances will generally increase as the battery um, actually ages. Now, if I wanted to understand the resistance of a simple resistor and for example you know we change the voltage from 10 volts to 20 volts and the current change from 2 amps to 4 amps then and i mean i, and I know many people watching this kind of video would have simple electronics or physics backgrounds you know and understand that that is reflecting a 5 ohm resistor now in impedance spectroscopy it's not just what i would call a dc signal actually it's an ac signal we have a sinusoidal excitation we have change the voltage in a sinusoidal fashion and there's a responding current which is also um, essentially tracking at the at the same frequency with that um, voltage um, excitation and we have a current response and there's a really a ratio between um, the voltage and the um, current and that ratio is really um, the resistance or impedance um, depending on which word you really want to use for this thing but that it's fairly simple in the simplest case, at least for a resistor to end, be able to actually calculate um, the resistance by just looking at the magnitude of the um, current response proportional to the voltage, and that therefore tells you the resistance. Now, if an electrochemical cell was a super simple system, then you could actually just model it as a resistor. Um, and a resistor, you apply voltage, the current immediately responds, you change the voltage, the current immediately changes with it. And so you would describe these things as being um, in sync or synchronous. Uh, in reality, electrochemical cells are not acting just like resistors. They're actually acting like a more complex circuit where maybe you have a resistor and a capacitor in parallel. And this means then when we're doing impedance spectroscopy, we may be applying a voltage and the current is following it, but it's slightly out of phase. And that slightly out of phaseness 
play um, actually is proportional to the kind of capacitant nature of the electrochemical cell. And so here I'm showing a more representative equivalent circuit for an electrochemical cell where I have a resistor in series with a capacitor and resistor which are in parallel with one another. Um, and so in impedance spectroscopy, um, we are, we've already mentioned it, we are changing the um, voltage and we're uh, measuring the current in response to it. If you have an electronics background, you're um, sort of familiar with these kind of les jour um, type curves. And these les type curves um, are actually showing you, um, really they're tracing the impedance or the relationship between the current and the um, applied potential. I've shown here frequency in hertz, because at the moment I'm just showing you a single frequency, um, let's say analysis, um, and this impedance. Now what we can do in electrochemistry, and really what we've learned from the electronics industry is, you know, we can split this impedance into actually two terms, or the sum of two terms, what's called the real impedance and the imaginary impedance. I don't like that term imaginary. This is not fairy tale stuff. It just means that um, it's the impedance that's out of phase um, between the um, voltage and the current response. There's a component that's out of phase, and we call that the sort of imaginary um, component. The real component tells you all about the resistances, and the imaginary component tells you something about the um, capacitance of it. And capacitors are interesting because they actually have a um, value that is in part governed by frequency. So when we talk about impedance spectroscopy, the spectroscopy bit means we're actually not using a single frequency, we're actually using a range of um, frequencies. So let's have our back to our, our electrochemical cell, um, which is a lithium ion battery in this case, and we've got an anode on the left hand side and a um, cathode on the right hand side, and the lithium ions are drifting across through the electrolyte and there's current running in the external um, part of the cell. And we can model that. I labeled it up here, the Randall circuit. This is a kind of classic in electrochemistry. A battery would have a slightly more, or electrochemical cell would have a slightly more complicated circuit, but there are components in this model that mean something in the real world. So here I put the electrolyte resistance. That means something. And this is the power really of electrochemical impedance spectroscopy in battery management systems and battery management system models because these components do mean something it's not as i say just a data pool and you you know the data is data science is very powerful these days um, but this is one technique where you're using data science and, and as i say anchoring it in real world um, parts so we have our electrolyte resistance um, this resistive value here we have our charge transfer resistance, and this kind of says, how easy is it for me to transfer electrons at that anode? And I have my capacitance value, which tells me how much charge am I storing at that anode? And any of these values um, change, and it tells us that the state of the battery is changing. The electrolyte resistance generally should be low. Um, if it's high, you're gonna start having a, um, an internal resistance, and you'll also see that in the temperature profile. But you'll probably find that electrochemical impedance spectroscopy is more sensitive than the temperature profile. Temperature is a very non-specific signal where impedance spectroscopy is quite specific. Um, and so you would expect the in a good battery to have quite low internal um, resistance. That capacitance value tells you something about the area of the anode. And if the anode, for example, starts to decompose and it starts changing its area, that capacitance value will change. You would want that charge transfer resistance to be fairly low so that electrons were hopping um, from the anodes to the external circuit quite readily. Um, if you have a high resistance at that point, you're gonna start getting, you know, if you were touching the terminal, it would feel quite hot because there's, a um, there's quite a high resistance at that point. Um, so frequency now allows us to start actually looking at this model and understanding what the values are of these individual components in this um, model. So we can play with frequency and this is the spectroscopy part of electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. So if I play one hertz then actually capacitors in that case have quite high impedance and so the um, current is running 
um, essentially through the electrolyte and through the charge transfer resistance. And when I say current, I actually know that what I'm really sort of talking about here is in part the migration of, of ions. Um, if I apply one megahertz, in fact, now the signal, if I can call it that, the current is actually going through the um, capacitor leg of this um, circuit and telling me more about the um, capacitor value than it's telling me about the charge transfer resistance. And then if I choose a intermediate value, I've got, I can actually, I'm sort of, it's basically going through both paths. So the spectroscopy part of electrochemical impedance spectroscopy says, don't just use one frequency, change frequencies, because at each frequency you're learning something different about this electrochemical cell. And so what this allows us to do then is actually, you know, do a range of essentially experiments but this is real-time experiments, you know, next to the battery pack, in the car, etc. Do a range of um, tests, let's say, at different frequencies. And though you wouldn't do this necessarily in a um, in the firmware of a battery management system, we can actually represent all the frequency data as what's called a Nyquist plot. And the Nyquist plot says, at this um, part of the plot, which is sort of the high frequency, I can tell you what um, the electrolyte resistance was and at this part of the Nyquist plot I can tell you something about the double layer capacitance I can tell you something about the lithium ion migration and I can tell you something about the um, charge transfer resistance at those um, electro at those electrodes so the model we can actually find out the values from the model from deconvoluting the impedance into the real and imaginary we plot the real and imaginary for example in the Nyquist plot and you would not do this by eye, but you, you know, to an electrochemist, we can we can literally interpret that and say, there's my electrolyte resistance, there's my charge transfer resistance, there's my um, double layer capacitance, and there's even a little term here which I haven't labelled up, which is called the Warburg element, which tells me something about the diffusion of or migration of ions in that um, electrochemical cell as well. Um, this is a side note, but at ZP we have um, hardware technology and we also have software technology. So we do have a database called Julie. And what's really powerful about um, Julie, this was developed by our team of engineers. They're actually able to take um, impedance spectroscopy um, data and um, essentially put it into the database. And the database will actually come back and say, okay, well, thank you for giving me the data. I'm actually going to suggest to you what the equivalent circuit actually is. Because um, one of the, sort of, let's say, issues sometimes with people understanding um, the application of EIS or electrochemical impedance spectroscopy into BMS, into battery management systems, is, you know, where are these, you know, how do I know what circuit is good? And the nice thing about Julie and the data science um, systems that we have is that actually suggests to you a circuit and um, even tell you um, exactly where it um, found the circuit so you could actually read the original paper for example slight side note but um, just part of the not just the hardware we have but also the um, data sciences part that we have at zp as well so i have talked a lot about i've tried to introduce impedance spectroscopy and the benefits i see for battery management systems and in particular understanding the component values within a battery like the resistance of the electrolyte like the resistance at the electrodes like the capacitance at the electrode and i want to show this image just to sort of say that all this technology didn't have to be large and very um lab based or test station based actually it can be quite small and um, when we couple that then with the power of actually interpreting that data um, and putting it into equivalent models um then it's become super powerful. And I just want to end with, if you have any questions um, regarding ZP, our um, expertise in electrochemistry, our expertise in electrochemical cells, our expertise in um, impedance spectroscopy, and the condensing of all of that into technologies that are suitable for battery management systems, then all I can say is please don't hesitate to contact us. Okay, thanks very much.